be checked. All right, recording has started now officially. So I'll just go backtrack. So for the recording, welcome to the Porous Media Visualization mini course based on the digital rocks portal data. My name is Masha Pradanovic and I will be teaching part of the course and uh, some parts will be taught by James McClure. And we will also have two presentations by our sponsor. Sponsors, uh, one is Dragonfly and uh, another one is um, Kitware, which is also the maker of Paraview Visualization. The main sponsor of the event is South Big Data Innovation Hub. They're actually the one that are pitching for the prizes. Um, uh, and then we have three industry sponsors in addition to, uh, uh, well, Mike, am I supposed to say ORS or Dragonfly? I refer to you by Dragonfly. Oh, uh, whatever. Yeah, we're Dragonfly. Correct that's, me, that's please. People okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the, what I want to use. <laughs> um, you fine. might have some other things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Object Research Systems is the maker of Dragonfly, which is going to be demoed today. And same thing, same problem we have at Paraview. So Paraview, the company is Kitware. And Paraview is one of their uh, uh, one of their options that we are interested in for visualizing data from Digital Rocks Portal. Uh, the Salt Systems is also a, a sponsor, and this fun names Enchanted Rock and Town Mountain Gra Granite. Granite Town Mountain Granite is the type of pink pink granite that outcrops uh, near Austin. And one of the famous outcrops, it's a monolith. It's uh, Enchanted Rock. If you're ever nearby, please visit. Um, and um, Austin chalk is type of limestone that outcrops uh, here around Austin as well. All right, so uh, this is a quick slide and huh? yes. You need to share your screen again because I think the uh, video turned it off. Yes. So. I'm gonna get this right. I'm gonna get this right. Share. Zoom will always try to throw a wrench in what you're doing. Well, to the problem with one thing that I'm uh, getting is that I cannot um, share screen and at the same time look at the chat properly, and I cannot manage recording properly when I'm sharing the screen, and that that kind of uh, tends to cause um, issues like this. And then I just start talking, and off we go. All right mini course sponsors. And then you will hear uh, more about Dragonfly today, but there's actually a related um, a webinar coming up on Tuesday in case that you're interested in um, building up on the knowledge that you get today. So just a brief agenda, we're gonna do go through a welcome. I'm gonna very briefly introduce um, everybody to uh, to, to the topic of porous materials, just in case. And then we will move on to demo using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, I hope that you have managed to download them. You can definitely execute them even if you don't know uh, Python, but we do assume some basic knowledge of uh, NumPy and Python. And the point of these first two, uh, uh, first two parts is basically to get your hands on the data and just check what the numbers within the images are, because that's often what can cause friction in doing anything uh, in scientific visualizations. So if it looks a little nitty gritty, it's actually on purpose uh, to just give you idea how to basically uh, create um, uh, the uh, data sets that you can interact with directly with code. Okay. Now, we will also have uh, uh, some interactive uh, uh, visualization shown. Uh, we will exemplify Maya V precisely because it actually pops up uh, from a Jupyter notebook. So it's one of the uh, visualiz visualizers out there. And then sponsors will actually show you how to do things a little easier just by uh, using GUIs and interacting with data directly. So that way you should actually really get a decent range of what options are out there uh, because visualization, especially of 3D data sets, it, it's not trivial. Um, so that's, I, I want to put that out uh, right there. And in that sense, um, we do have a, a, a wide range of people here, so everybody should be able to gain something. Um, those are the rules I already shared via email, so I'm not gonna belabor the point. Uh, we have audience today that is diverse, 
Uh, so uh, Javier was here uh, nice enough to put a map. This is a map of those who signed up by Monday. So we can see that we actually have people from all over the world who signed up. Uh, majority is dominated by graduate, uh, graduate students. Um, some of them, some people typed in PhD students in, in US. We actually, graduate students are both masters and PhD students, so technically those two uh, need to be counted in graduate students. Then we have some undergrads um, and some also postdoctoral researchers. So this is a pretty wide range. So before uh, we actually continue, I'm going to stop sharing and run a quick poll. Uh, so I would like you to tell me uh, to identify the level of knowledge you have about porous media images. And could be none, entry level, medium level, expert users. This is again, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're gonna try to at least attempt to cater to all. So if you can fill out the poll, please identify the level of knowledge you have about porous media images. And I do assume that most people are related to rocks and soils and subsurface porous materials, but porous materials, there are plenty of others, of course. So I'm gonna wait a couple of more seconds um, since that about 90% people have voted or put in their So it has stabilized at 87%. I think that's as good as we're gonna get. So here are the results. So basically we have a um, majority of participants in the entry and medium level, but then we have some people who have no uh, experience and some people who are experts. Yeah. So please be understanding of that um, because um, that's, that's, that's a challenge uh, right there, okay. Back to my presentation. All right. So just in case there are people who actually have not really seen, so there are some people who are at the entry level, I'm going to assume that possibly you don't even know what images of porous media are about. So I'm just going to do a brief uh, presentation that introduces that uh, so that you understand what data is found in Digital Rocks portal. So this is a brief introduction to rock and fluids and subsurface. So this is a Barton Creek Greenbelt. This is a creek in Austin. So when you actually zoom, in, it's it, typically in July and August, it is actually dry and it flows only underneath the surface. If I zoom in further, I can actually cut a piece of that uh, rock bed at the bottom of the creek. So this is uh, limestone. This is actually Austin chalk lime, uh, limestone. And then I need x-ray region uh, to actually uh, keep zooming in to actually see the structure. Not only the, this, what you see here is a CT scanner, and we're going to exemplify one of those images from Digital Rocks portal later. However, so however, um, we need to, uh, so that's millimeter resolution and often not enough to resolve all of the intricacies of the pore space. You need to go even further to microtomography or X-ray microtomography. And then you can actually, this is an image of a sandstone, see individual grains of sand. And this is pore space. These are sand grains. And this is one slice through an X-ray image. There's about two millimeters here. Uh, of a cross section. This is a three dimensional rendering and there's actually quite a bit of processing that goes from here to this representation of this surface and we're gonna get to that today. Now, if I actually look at the limestone, inside could be quite complicated. I might have, this is again about three millimeters across. You could have some fractures, some vugs or opening. You could have some microporous space that is actually not resolved with this imaging. And this was imaged with a, a voxel length of three microns. And if I actually cut a surface through the three dimensional part here, I can actually see 
this bug in 3D, as well as the fracture in between these pore spaces. It's quite a complicated structure, pore structure. So this is just to introduce you how some of these uh, can look like. Now, if I actually add fluids to it, which I sit in a petroleum engineering department, a lot of people in petroleum engineering departments or environmental engineering departments, uh, civil engineering and so forth, they create, uh, as well as hydrology within geology, they care about the fluids moving through the subsurface. And typically we have up to three types of phases. Um, water, oil, and gaseous phases. So if you actually look at this image here, this is uh, courtesy of Dorothy Wildenschild. Um, this is glass beads. Then you have water and air. So this is three different phases and you're looking at three different cross sections. This is within a capillary. You can actually see uh, oil as well added to the mix. And you can see that these two uh, fluids can meet at different angles. This is called a contact angle. And that makes displacement of these fluids uh, by each other uh, much more interesting and harder to simulate. Okay. Now reservoir that is way under your feet will have um, different uh, zones with different saturations of fluids. And you will typically have some sort of a seal or literally a cap on top of the surface uh, that keeps the fluids below. So that is a structural trap. And then you will have, because of the densities, you will have water, oil, and gas stacked on top of each other. So when you look at the little piece of rock, this is all rocks. This is not some big magic pool underneath. So basically when you look at the uh, rocks that are uh, here so partially saturated with uh, water and uh, oil. You can actually see water here imbibed and has drained oil down to what's called the residual phase. And those are blobs of fluids, a uh, fluid here in blue that are sitting in the rock space that is in uh, gray. And this is actually sort of the image that I'm using as a logo for digital rocks. There's a lot of this type of experiments uh, on digital rocks portal. And we're going to visualize one of them. Now, when you look at the Grand Canyon, that is a face, famous stack of rocks. Uh, they're very cool rocks. Uh, it's an amazing crosscut of the subsurface, but they're not a reservoir because there are no fluids in there. Okay. All right. So now what is Digital Rocks Portal about? So we basically gather a lot of um, images in one place. These images are large and you will that, that will probably cause friction as you download and try to work with them. Uh, so this is partly to introduce that complexity. And basically this is a website portal that connects uh, you as a user to the data that is stored uh, on uh, Texas Advanced um, Computing uh, Center resources. And in addition to just data sets, there's also a lot of what's called metadata that gives you information about what type of experiment was captured or if it was a simulation, what were some of the parameters that went inside that normally are actually not just stored in an image in itself. So you need some additional information first for instance, information that you need is, well, what is the length of this side or what is the length of one of the units that we re refer to as pixel or voxel, that is the numerical cell for an image. Okay. This is some examples right now, there's 117 projects and over 650 users. And there is anything and everything from a FIB SEM image, uh, to a high resolution two dimensional SEM image. So this is microscopy data. Then there's experimental 3D velocimetry. So this is a 3D velocity field captured experimentally. And to my knowledge is one of the only such uh, examples out there available. Two image experiments, for instance, this is done with CT um, and you can look at the straining of particles which are here in the higher or more, more yellow is where you have more smaller particles that you actually can't resolve, but you see their, um, their density or concentration within a porous matrix. And there is also a bug opening in the middle. So there's a wide range of different types of uh, both experiments and uh, simulations captured. General vision, so right now is we have portal as a web-based data repository. Um, we want to basically integrate with multiple other tools that work with data in the portal. And this course is a starting point to start doing that more broadly. Uh, so essentially we would like to enable 
easier search, which is right now um, complicated or kind of manual really uh, on the portal. So that needs to be automated. We also want to automate the simulation or use of those um, uh, data sets so that it, things are actually way more easier and streamlined because that causes a lot of friction in part because data is pretty large. And then one would also like to start gathering information about if everybody does some type of simulation, if they commit um, this information back to the portal, maybe we can actually start gathering libraries of, for instance, permeability versus porosity type of relationships for different types of media. Okay? Um, so if you want to sign up for updates and newsletters, we have newsletters right now, we started them, we just started them. So we're gonna probably have them once a month, uh, then please do so using this link. And you can also follow us on Twitter. That is also relatively new development. Uh, at the end of this course, if you deem that you would like access to a virtual machine uh, hosted by Texas Advanced Compu Computing Center, then please let me know. And we will, for the purpose of uh, completing this visualization challenge, uh, we will create it. Visualization challenge uh, is uh, the submissions are due on December 1st. And um, unfortunately, I don't want to state that clearly because of the tax laws, we cannot send money outside of the United States. Uh, so, but if you do submit an entry and participate in an entry, uh, we will definitely uh, look at it alongside all the others. It's just that you might not be able to uh, get that price. Yeah? However, if you need to virtual machine account to actually try things out, do let me know. Okay. So data in digital rocks portal is 2D and 3D, uh, and some of it is actually technically 4D. Uh, formats vary because there is no accepted standard. And this, again, this mini course is attempt to kind of resolve some of that or help with that. Uh, well, digital works portal is attempt to help with that. Geometry is defined by scale, scalar fields, images that I refer to as images, and they can have a gray scale. This is what we see uh, visually represented. Those are typically X-ray, microscopy, MRI images. They have certain range of values within. That's what we mean by grayscale. And segmented or binary data, where that initial grayscale image was labeled in some way to distinguish phases within. That could be fluids or minerals. Okay? And that depends on what was actually imaged. There are also some velocity fields. Most of them are actually 3D uh, velocity fields, uh, mostly coming from simulation. And there is one experimental. But there might be three images with Vx, Vy, Vz for a velocity field. So if velocity field is a vector field, it has three components. So I need three images to store that data. So this is just to give you some idea of the variety in there. And then when we visualize, before we visualize, we want to decide what it is that you want to do. Um, do you want to just place points around? Do you want to draw lines? Do you want to do a surface? something like all of these are points, lines, surface, okay? And, or do you just want to work with the 3D volume, okay? Is your data just data, which in Digital Rocks Portal, that is an example of just having data, or is it maybe defined by some sort of a function that you're trying to fit to the data, okay? So you also need to define to your visualizer what are the colors, orientation, which side are you viewing that three-dimensional object from? And you can actually see where the complexity of visualizing arises. So there's one thing is that there is visualization tools typically should be interactive because it's extremely hard for a visualizing software to immediately set the image in a way that user might want, especially when you don't know what's in the image itself. So without further ado, I'm going to leave these, the rest of the slides, which are available to you for download, um, both on the GitHub and the uh, shared folder. Uh, I'm going to actually jump into a uh, demo. Okay. So we're going to open the first Jupyter Notebook that is going to introduce you to uh, the images. And let me just adjust the sizes here. Okay. 
Okay, so I have included quite a bit of the, the information that I already narrated inside of these Jupyter notebooks so that they can actually be self-contained study guide. But uh, the point, basic point of the first introduction is that images are everywhere. You of course uh, use photographs or this actually screen that we are looking at is a color image. Most of the time in applications for scientific purpose, image is a reflection of something that was measured. So for the most time, part, it's going to actually be grayscale in the sense that it has only one piece of information within for every point. Color image actually has three pieces of information that make up that color, okay? So that's something to think about. However, when I'm storing color versus just grayscale, then I, uh, for color, I'm using three times as much uh, space. So we need to account for that. So in terms of color, we need often, most often, there are multiple ways to show color, but I'm just gonna exemplify one. You have like RGB channels and each of those RGB channels has one numeric value. Depending on the software that, or that produces it, that value might either be between zero and 255 scale integer or it could actually be between zero and one, okay? Uh, so this zero to 55 is the cheapest way to store that data because it stores one byte or eight bits of data uh, on the, uh, in computer memory, okay? Some, uh, so sometimes the three pieces of information, three times eight bit will be called 24 bit RGB format. Now, uh, just to, if you want to just play with colors, which can be important in your visualization, so I don't want to uh, bring it up. Here is one example where you can actually play with different colors. So we can see if we just put 255 or the maximum number for red and no green and no blue, we just get plain red, okay? What I'm wearing here is called burnt orange at UT and is actually 191, 87 and zero. So let's try that one, 87. And you can see this burnt orange. You can of course go try out uh, any color that you'd like, which might be something that you wanna do in your visualization, play with colors, that makes it fun, okay? That said, typical scientific information behind is probably not colored, okay? There's one case uh, where the, so, so example, there's an example, uh, grayscale, what we refer to as a grayscale image, and we're gonna play with it, okay? So this is a SEM, uh, this is microscopy image, scanning electron microscopy, and it's two-dimensional uh, data, and you can see different gray values that reflect um, the mineral phases or the lack thereof in this uh, surface. Now, there is sometimes the only time they're actually true uh, color is this type of image, which is a thin section. And this is actually done with light, light microscopy. So here is one example uh, where you can have the blue is epoxy where the pore spaces are. So these are just some examples of grayscale and, uh, and, uh, and color images. Now, CT images uh, are often three-dimensional. They can be on different scale. CT refers to millimeter resolution. Uh, micro CT or X-ray microtomography refers to uh, micron resolution. This is where we actually can resolve the details. So here an ex example grayscale um, image, and we're gonna work with that one uh, later today, but let me actually look at the original data. So you can actually see this is a cross section through a, C, a CT example. Here you can actually view a movie on the uh, Digital Rocks portal moving through the stack of these images. Okay? And you can see pore space and this is Ketten limestone and then there's oil and water in the pore space and you can actually see the contact angle between them. Okay, so there's the block. Now to, to get this image to what is shown on the, to get this image to what is shown on this main web page is the basically visualization type of processing that we're gonna get to by the end of this course. 
All right. Now, where is Python in manipulating images? Python is pretty advanced in processing photographs, especially for various machine learning and deep learning uh, prospects and recognition. Uh, but that type of processing is not necessarily equivalent or good enough often for scientific visualization. So you have to be very careful in part, and I'm gonna exemplify that in part because often these algorithms, they change the range of data without telling you that range might actually appear the same on the screen, but they have changed the underlining uh, data and that can cause trouble if you're actually trying to do some science with it. Okay? So be, be mindful of that. Now, I assume here that you have some basic uh, knowledge of Python in NumPy, even if you don't, if you have actually Jupyter Notebooks uh, through Anaconda distribution, for instance, um, on your computer, you can execute this even if you don't know. Uh, what they are. Now, in terms of imaging, uh, we're going to work with Sky Image and their uh, module uh, scikit image. There's also Pillow and OpenCV2. I'm not going to go into details. At the time when I did a little bit of research on this, it appeared this is literally last um, July. Uh, it appeared that Sky Image is the most mature for now among them. Though they go up and down, up and down, I call that sinusoidal de development in open source uh, software. So that's maybe not going to be true uh, one year from now. Uh, another package that you might want to investigate for image processing for porous media is called PoreSpy, and it's linked here. Okay. Now, outside Python, MATLAB is very mature. However, you need a paid license, and that uh, I find. Well, personally, I prefer open source software. That said, it's more streamlined because you paid, pay, pay for that type of service. Image Fiji and Image J is very uh, famous and uh, it started the microscopy. So it's uh, processing stacks of images uh, very well. It has a lot of algorithms that are within, which is very useful. In terms of visualization or 3D visualization, it's actually lagging behind the software that we're going to exemplify in this uh, in this course. So that's just for your information. There's actually more of it on the slides that I shared, um, uh, more information on visualization software that I'm going to get to after we uh, go through this basic exercise on 2D arrays. All right. So First, we're just going to do a very basic example, just to give you some idea of what is the data behind every image. So we're going to create a very, very simple three by five, three by five, that's 15 numbers array, and show it on the screen. Okay? Just to get the, and we will start with image, uh, image of zeros and ones. That's what we would refer to as a binary or a segmented image. Now, this one will be done. It will be like a checkered box. Okay, uh, so it's not going to be necessarily representative of a porous material, but work with me here. It's easy to get. If you need more NumPy information, uh, there is some links here. Feel free to look at also my, I teach an introduction to programming and numerical methods course that is actually on my YouTube. Um, so you can actually look not for this year because now we're um, uh, those uh, videos are actually behind the firewall uh, this year, but in the previous years, there's actually a bunch of videos. And if you want associated um, associated lecture notes, please let me know. I will uh, gladly share. Now, we will import NumPy, and uh, this is a plotting module. And we will literally, this is NumPy zeros command will initialize this array to just zeros, three by five. This is the way we are doing dimensions in NumPy. Now, I will, this is a way, I'm not gonna go into details of it, but it's a skip every two, starting from the original image and set those from one. And in the second dimension, start from the, so numerical index, indexing of the arrays starts from zero. If you've done MATLAB before or Octave, then you start from one. Here we start from zero. Okay. So just every second element set to one. And this is what you do uh, uh, for a number of them to set them to one. And let's then show that image. Basic command, 
uh, for showing images is I am show, color map is gray, everything else is a little bit of a dress up. I'm labeling my X and Y. Uh, X and Y uh, axes and putting a color bar. So when I execute that, I'm going to get my checkered box. So I can see from the color bar that these are my zeros. These are my ones. Now this is an array of numbers. Each number is shown as a pixel. This is pretty much what images do, including your screen, your computer screen. So each number is a pixel that uh, has a value. And here I can also see that sort of like on the grid, physical grid or physical area that this image represents, I'm starting from minus 0.5 to 2.5. So basically my original uh, origin, that first number, which is a zero, is uh, its center is right here, but it's shown as a pixel that has area. In 3D, I will show a little box okay, that has a volume. Okay? And that's what we refer to as a voxel or numerical cell. Now these are again, zeros to uh, ones. So I would, uh, how many of you are actually playing with this as we speak? I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a moment just to check in. There's a couple of you are two, only two. Everybody else is just watching what I do, three, four. Show in some way, you can also, okay. So we have a good number of people trying it out. So, okay, I want to give you a little bit space now to do that. I'm gonna reshare my screen for those uh, of you that are not um, uh, doing on your own computer. But now play with it a little, and I have some questions in the in the afterwards. So if I change my color map, so if one of this is if I change my color map to summer or your favorite color map, you can uh, search for them online. Uh, then we will actually see a slightly different image. So this is my summer color map. Okay. This is what I mean that the color here is fake. This is prettier if you like green and yellow better, but the numbers below are still zeros and ones. Okay? So it's a choice of what you do. That's what I mean by fake color. Um, there's another, I don't know, plasma. There's some that I remember, here we go. If you like blue and yellow better, here it is. Okay? And this range is chosen for you automatically based on range that is actually uh, seen in the image. You can check this command if you actually want to fix the range. I'm not gonna go into that. Okay. And there is the zero to one. Um, uh, so, so that will actually show you. So it's important to have this color bar often just to see what the, number, the numbers are. Now, if you check change one of these values to two, okay? So I'm gonna check my origin to two, just to also see where is the origin, okay? So on this image, origins in, is in upper left corner. It's important, that's where images often start. That's not, not where your Cartesian coordinate system that you were taught in math in your geometry class starts. That one starts, starts in the lower corner lower left. So just be mindful of that because that can flip like what you're seeing and where it's at. And this is where I want to get at, like know where your data is. Okay. And the best is to do a small example. All right. And you can see that this is flipped. Now yellow is that largest value, which became two. And before ones were yellow. Okay. So that's this relative fake color that I'm talking about. All right. Now, Let's actually now just grab an image from online. And when it's a sm small image, it's actually really easy to do. So I'm gonna exemplify here a function, I am read function, which is fairly robust. And then just also showing it in that same I am show function. So I'm gonna give it a URL. This is basically where cover image for the Rocks portal is. If you're 
connection is bad, then you can actually just, uh, that cover image is in the shared folder downloaded already. So this image should not take long, but if there is an image that I downloaded all of the images that we are gonna use in that uh, course data. And uh, Javier, please, could you reshare? So for those who started later, uh, they probably don't see my chat uh, with the uh, uh, course uh, data. So please, can you reshare data in GitHub again? I'd, uh, I'd appreciate that. So, uh, so whoever joined later can see that on the chat. All right, so I am going to read that image from the provided uh, website and just show it. It looks familiar. I'm using and abusing this all over uh, my slides and digital works portal. Uh, it's actually one of the first visuals, visualizations I've done a long time ago. So this is actually a, a, a old image. So it, if it looks a little, um, well, here it's actually squished. So that's why it doesn't look very crisp. But if it looks that it should be a little crisper, that's because it's rather old, okay? All right. Now I have some comments here. If you download the image, then your operating system will place that image in a specific folder that you, do, you can either refer to as a full path, okay? And then download it from that image path instead of the URL if uh, that is the problem. You're gonna have uh, images like that, okay? All right, so now let's go to something bigger and better. And that's actually that, uh, North Sea sandstone image that you can see that it's even its cover image is loading uh, for a moment on the uh, website. It is a high resolution, so less than 0.2 microns resolution sandstone image. So that's why it's rather large. So if I actually want to, I'm not going to exemplify this, uh, but this uh, this is again you you give it a URL. And if you actually try to, if when I initially tried to do this, this failed miserably. Um, and there is actually, I'm leaving this as a, an example of what could happen on your machine, but maybe it doesn't. That really depends on your particular computer. So, so, so the the I am read will actually try to a number of different routines. Like it kind of goes down the list of what it could read in. Okay. And by the end of it, it just says, okay, whatever it is that I tried, it didn't work. And it points to a decompression bomb error. And basically image size exceeds the limit that was set by the system. Now I found on a, a website and my laptop is 16 gigabyte of RAM. It's a Windows machine. So a relatively standard laptop, nothing to write home about, but it's also not the best one ever. This is just a laptop. It's not a desktop uh, machine. So basically I found online solution for it. Based, there is uh, uh, an internally set maximum for image pixels that has to be set to none to process this. This entire long story, which was totally too long, is to tell you that when you're working with porous media images, they're large and you're gonna come, you're gonna push against limits of your laptop or some software built-in limit and so forth. Because most of the use out there, most of the use out there is not for large images, but it's for much smaller uh, photographs and such. So you have to be mindful of that. Okay? So it's just gonna happen. And also the pace of imaging is developing at much faster pace than we can actually process those images. So we're always catching up in terms of scientific um, uh, imaging. It's definitely the resolutions are getting better and better. And there are two dimensional images, two dimensional maps that come from multi-beam SEM with 90 plus beams at the same time, which create 200 gigabytes images and larger, just in 2D, okay? So in that sense, uh, that's what I mean. And probably nobody's sitting here, nobody's laptop is that good. <laughs> so if it is, please let me know. So, uh, so in any way, uh, so that's something that you will be always pushing against. 
and this is also the reason why we want to uh, add more uh, parallel visualization capability to digital rocks portal down the line. All right. So if I actually do this fix, then I can actually execute this. And I'm actually curious if you want to execute, um, let me know how long it took you. My laptop slash my connection to the internet takes about 50 seconds for this to complete. You can see that. And when you do, you can show the image. Now, before I uh, continue, uh, I'm just gonna. Oh, okay. There's. Okay, everybody is already answering small questions. Yes. So, for instance, when it, I actually have this nice little extension that I can tell you after I stop talking about that actually tells me when something is queued for execution. I'm gonna actually re-execute it now. So it's going to tell me, oh, it's queued. So it's telling me that it's running, but you can also see that right here. So I'm going to, uh, I see a lot of action in chat that is covered. So Q&A is going in chat. Uh, I'm going to pause for a moment and just ask if you need to ask something in person, do so. If not, chat is there uh, precisely for that. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to, so you can see how it's queued. So it's going to take a moment. I'm just going to do some basic inspection. And again, this is a little bit nitty gritty, but I'm going to also show you for a reason for doing that or having to do that and be mindful of possible change done to your, um, to your image. So if I want to plot image size, um, I will actually uh, do that in megabytes, okay? I'm gonna also plot uh, the shape of the array. So that's uh, image.shape and also data type. Those three things are important to know about your image. So if anything in any software, please pay attention to the size of the data. If you can't do something, size is typically the reason. The data type, because different types, integers, versus real numbers, which is often called floats or doubles on uh, machines, they take different amount of memory. So for instance, integers are typically 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit integers. So one, two, and four bytes. Whereas single precision floating point number is four bytes and double precision is eight. So if I'm, even if I have zeros and ones, if I, save them as 8-bit or 1-byte integer, okay, versus if I save them as double precision floating point, double precision floating point will take eight times more memory for the same type of data, that little checkered image of zeros and ones. Okay? So that's why you want to be careful about that. Okay? And then basic statistics minimum, maximum, and average values uh, in image histogram. I have a little, okay. Fix here on the fly. All right, so let's uh, do this. So I'm just gonna execute this so you can actually see it. Uh, so you will see that it, this image has in megabytes, it's about 200 megabytes. So it's way more than your regular photograph. Um, image sh shape is over 12,000 by over 16,000. That's a lot. The type of data is unsigned integer with eight bits, U int eight. And then values are from zero to 254 as they would be for unsigned integer. And the mean, which is really meaningless here, but mean is 141. I like monitoring these values to see what happened to my data. And this is your histogram of different phases in the image. Typical, naturally, you will see some spread because of the noise in imaging. When you see just a peak that is just like this, this is artificial. Or some phase, maybe air is just there present. Uh, so this is black. Uh, no, this is white. So there is some uh, artificial 
uh, numbers that just show up as a single peak. That's typically something. That, and I have three dominant phases. One of them is pore space and two are the mineral phases. All right, let's just, uh, if you want to customize color in Matplotlib, there is some comments that I'm not gonna go over here. Uh, so you can customize your uh, plot into a slightly different histogram, should you like. So I'm not gonna go over that. What I'm gonna go over is now difference between a uh, regular image and color image. So color image typically has shape uh, n by m, which was the original shape we had by three. So I have three channels or sometimes even four channels. So three are for color, one could be transparency. So if you notice actually, this image has some transparency in it, that cover image, okay? This surface, gray surface is transparent. All right, so where was I? Back to this images. So then my cover image had that. So we can actually execute and see that it actually has transparency channel. So it has four channels for color. This is uh, the, so this is basically the original image size that as I see on the screen, but then I have four channel, channels in war, informing me about the colors and it's also uint eight. So again, now I could do histogram for all three channels, red, green, and blue. And there's not much red and green, there's quite a bit of blue, right? Because most of it is gray. Gray as a color is basically has equal red, green, and blue channel, equal value. And that's a certain level of gray. Whereas blue is specifically blue. That means that red and green channels for these blue parts are close to zero and blue is one of the maximum values. Okay? So now be careful again, because if you have a color image, your histogram has to basically histogram all three channels separately. Okay. So now I'm gonna crop uh, that large image, okay? the one that had 12,000 times 16,000. And this is just basically how you, you create a copy of it. That is just the first 500 by 500. Okay? It's a smaller image and I'm gonna show it. So this is basically the upper corner of that large image to actually see some details. Often easier to ver work on a smaller crop, which is why I'm showing you how to do it. So you can see where my X's and Y's or rows and columns are. Also, so where my X is around 10, so I plotted just for fun as a, a, a value at 10 and 220. So where my X is about 10 and 220, so around here, the value is 28. So it's zero is black, so it's closer to black. So just to inspect the value. There's an interactive image viewer. I'm actually curious um, if this should work. It works, uh, but it sometimes works. It sometimes doesn't <laughs> on uh, different computers. So Sky Image has a test viewer that will actually do a little bit of more interaction. And it has a number of plugins. This plugins. This is in development, okay? where you can uh, inspect. Uh, some of the more advanced visualizers we're going to show are a little better at this, but I'm going to show it anyway as one of the options. So you can do line profiles, um, and you can also do uh, cropping in this interactive image viewer. So if I do that, it opens a separate image right here. Do you all see it? And now you can actually, so there is actually a line profile that was set here already. Uh, it's rather faint on my screen. I hope you can see. Okay. So you can see as you move along that line, you can also crop. Uh, so this is a cropping tool as well. You can see along that line that was put what are the image values as you go across the line? So here I'm first uh, in a solid space, solid space. Then I'm moving to the gray, uh, uh, to the pore space. 
Then I'm moving through some stuff that is sitting in the pore space. Some of this might be clay or just edges of the solid phase. And as I move through, I can see how values change. So this is interaction with the image just to see what you have in the image. Now you can also crop here. And, uh, you can also reset. So you can do this a little interactively. This is just uh, one way. And then you can do plus and minus keys or mouse scroll uh, to set the width of the scan line, okay? And you can drag. So it's, it's, it's interactive, you can drag things around. So if I drag the ends, I can change where it goes. There we go. So now my profile changes as well. I have some suggested exercises at the end of this, but this is the basic introduction to the um, to the two uh, D images. So I'd I'd like to answer. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see better. Uh, I'd like to stop uh, sharing. Um, and stop and see if there are any questions. Oh, um, there's a question, why the size of that digital rocks portal cover image has two dimensions instead of three? It's because it's a snapshot. It's not a slice. It's actually a snapshot of a three-dimensional visualization. We're gonna get through the three-dimensional visualization. But even if you have 3D visualization, you're rotating and working with it on a screen and it shows as something at the screen, that cover image is what shows on the screen. It has actually no 3D data behind. The three-dimensional part is actually due to the color channels. Those of you who are following with notebooks, are you? I see some people are asking questions. I hope that that means that they're good. Okay. So here's a question. Some of us use software such as ImageJ or Avisa. What is your preferred software for image processing? I go back and forth. Um, I tend to use open source, so I'm not a skilled Aviso user. I don't have a license. Um, I've been using. I've been teaching digital rocks uh, petrophysics for a while. Initially, mostly with ImageJ, and for any initial in investigation of a stack of image slices, I think ImageJ or Fiji rather, um, it's Fiji flavor <laughs> or package uh, is very good. And to this day for sort of like resizing and manipulation, especially at the initial investigation, such as this sky image viewer, <laughs> I would do that in Fiji. I am actually trying, Python is behind in that sense. Sky image is trying to get there. Okay. Uh, and I found only this year, literally this summer that sky image is starting to have comparable tools. And I'd like to shift to Python uh, because Python enables a lot of other workflows to be bound together. Uh, 3D visualization in ImageJ is subpar. Okay. So ImageJ is great for slice viewing and manipulation, cropping, uh, investigation of that type of sort. It also has a lot of software plugins uh, like people have contributed to it. So if you want to test an algorithm, it's quite likely implemented, which is useful. So, and again, I've been teaching with ImageJ and Fiji for, how long have, you, have I been teaching these things? Since 2011, you, you do the math, okay? 
So, but now I'm trying to transition to more of a Python and actually this is the first part of that. Now, in terms of visualizations, uh, I think three visualizers that are gonna be um, shown here in this course are top of the line in terms of uh, crispness of their images, <laughs> okay? But as I'm gonna point out, and I have that in slides, I'm not gonna pull up slides for that, 3D visualization is difficult. Hardware issues are common. Um, so in that sense, one has to be mindful. Actually, maybe I can quickly slides, uh, show those slides of the, so they're shared on the visualization software. So MATLAB is great for smaller stuff. It's very nice and crisp, but then once you scale the size, you just, most of the stuff in Digital Rocks portal cannot be dealt with with MATLAB. So it's a pity, but it's what it is. There is Octave as a free version of MATLAB and it's always lagging and specifically in speed. So there's actually for a specific, uh, that said, I do use my, I kind of use everything. Um, so the, we, we actually noticed that specific image processing routines were five times slower in Octave than they were in MATLAB. So that gives you an idea. Part of you, part of you and visit part of you will be exemplified today are uh, for parallel simulation. They were created for processing parallel simulation outputs. So if you think you will be doing parallel simulation, then they're good uh, options. Uh, Maya Beef was recently revived. It kind of has this sinusoidal up and down in terms of working on different hardware. Uh, so it does have some issues on Mac. Uh, so that's just a warning. Uh, Dragonfly is free for research, otherwise it's paid for and there will be a, a demo uh, today. Uh, Drishti and Mike Marsh from Dragonfly is with us. Uh, so if you have any questions and for part of you, there is a Sebastian. Is Sebastian, are you around? He's logging in for sure for the demo. I am around, sorry. You are, all right. So he has identified himself. So if you have questions about Parview and Dragonfly, there are people who know much more about it <laughs> here on the call. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, interact in chat. Okay. Uh, and Parview we actually had uh, added to, as for remote visualization, which is currently being revamped in Digital Rocks portal, so you cannot access it, but we were actually engaging visualization on a parallel machine uh, through Digital Rocks portal uh, using a remote desktop capability. Uh, there's Pergeos, uh